Hello everybody, welcome to this session about rethinking the role of teaching assistants when supporting students with Down syndrome in inclusive classrooms. I'd like to start off by saying thank you so much to the organisers of this Congress for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you all. This is my fourth World Down Syndrome Congress and I'm really thrilled and honoured to be here with you again to talk about something that you'll no doubt be able to tell um, is something that I'm really passionate about. Now, my name is Amanda Corby. I work for an organisation based here in Australia called Alum Learning, and we provide support to schools and families uh, around including students with Down syndrome and disabilities within their schools and classrooms. I have been working in this space for almost two decades now. Um, my roles range from everything from classroom teacher right through to the consultancy work that I do today. I've included my contact details there. I would love to connect with you. So please feel free to get in touch. As I mentioned, during the session, we're gonna be focusing on the role that teaching assistants play within our classrooms. What we're seeing is a long-term international trend toward inclusive education. And this is happening across the globe. And as a result of this, we're seeing more and more teaching assistants working within our schools. What we're also seeing, which is really great, is a large body of international research that is starting to really look at the role that teaching assistants play and examine the effectiveness of the support that they provide. This research has been done globally. Um, of note would be the work being done in the US, in Denmark, in Australia, um, but probably most notably in the UK. And the DIS project, the Deployment and Impact of Support Staff, was the largest study of teaching assistants and support staff that has been carried out in the, in the world to date. So I'll be referencing that one a couple of times today. The research has raised some really important questions around the effectiveness of our current models of support. And so we're really gonna talk about that in this session today. What I do want to recognise is that there is quite significant variance between schools, um, between states and countries around how teaching assistants are used. Also, you know, similarly, um, the language that is used. So you'll notice that I use the term teaching assistant as a more broad term, but absolutely we're talking about any kind of support staff that are working within your school, um, whether you call them teacher aides, educational assistants, integration aides. Um, so you'll find I'll use that terminology of teaching assistant during the session. So we're going to have a look at some of the key findings from this international research. And we're going to particularly look at four different areas. Preparedness, so how prepared our teaching assistants are for their roles. Deployment, how they are placed and, and used in our schools. Practice, what is happening on the ground in the classrooms. And finally, we're going to look at the impact of these teaching assistants on student outcomes. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be drawing upon a whole lot of different studies today. When we look at deployment to start off with, we see that generally our teaching assistants are being deployed in one of three ways. They are either working alongside teachers in the regular classroom, so supporting the classroom teacher. Secondly, they may be working to deliver structured interventions. And these interventions usually are taking place during the regular class time and, and typically away from that regular lesson. So this might be when a teaching assistant is delivering a particular reading program, um, uh, any kind of remediation or, you know, intervention program. And thirdly, we find that teaching assistants are often deployed in a way to support students' positive approaches to learning. So supporting student behaviour, social, emotional development, etc. So what the research really finds in this area is that our teaching assistants are often playing quite an informal role within classrooms and often are quite an informal instructional role where they're supporting students with the greatest level of need, such as our students with Down syndrome. Something the research highlights quite often is this idea of a separation effect. So quite often the work the teaching assistant is doing with our students with Down syndrome is taking place away from the regular class. So away from the classroom teacher and away from the student's peers. And the research also reports that quite often it's the teaching assistant who is adopting this status of primary educator for students with Down syndrome. <clears throat> 
When we look at how prepared teaching assistants are um, for the role that they play, the research tells us, well, the vast majority of teaching assistants report that they don't have any really specific time to plan and, and feedback with the teachers they're working with. Alternatively, you know, the communication that's taking place is, is very much ad hoc. It's happening on the fly. And as a result, quite often they have reported that they feel quite underprepared for the tasks that they're doing and the roles that they're playing. When we look at what's happening, you know, on the ground, we see that teaching assistants assume much of the responsibility for that moment by moment pedagogical decision making within classrooms. They're having to take a task and decide how they're going to adapt that task for the student with Down syndrome. They're having to provide high amounts of verbal differentiation to explain that task. And quite often the emphasis is on getting that task finished and getting it completed correctly. When we look really specifically about, well, what are the outcomes for our students when they've got that teacher aid support? It's really quite interesting. And the research tells us that the more support students receive, particularly in this, 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 this um, study, actually the less progress they made and that the typical deployment of teaching assistants under everyday informal conditions is not leading to significant improvements in academic outcomes for our students. That finding is really quite significant. And in fact, the research tells us that oftentimes the presence of a teaching assistant can increase dependency for a student. So when they have looked at this research, they've looked at two, two areas uh, of where the teaching assistants were providing support. They looked at that in-class support, so often that informal, unsupported instructional role. And they also looked at when the teaching assistants are delivering these intervention programs. And the research found little to no impact of a teaching assistant when delivering that informal in-class support. When they looked at structured interventions, they did find a positive impact on the role of a teaching assistant. But really importantly, the teaching assistant had to be delivering a structured intervention program that was evidence-based and that they had received some kind of, you know, high quality training around how, how they deliver that intervention. So I don't know about you, but for me, when I first started becoming interested in this area and reading all of this research, I think it actually raised more questions for me than answers. And I found some of that information really quite surprising, um, quite confronting. Um, and so this is what really drove me to, to want to learn more and to work within this space. What I'm going to do now is start to give you some, some recommendations. So what does the research tell us will work and will ensure that we're getting those positive outcomes for our, our students with Down syndrome? Now, I'll, I just want to mention it was a very quick summary of the research, um, but I want to move on to these recommendations here. And these recommendations have been drawn from the research studies that I reference, um, but also from the best practice that I've observed. I'm really lucky to work in a number of schools across Australia, schools that are reforming the way they use their teaching assistants. Um, and so I can share some of that information in these recommendations with you. So if we talk about preparedness, so how do we make sure that our teaching assistants are prepared for what they're doing? The big thing here is we have got to allow for time, time for our teaching assistants and classroom teachers to plan, to prepare for lessons and to feed back together after a lesson has taken place. Important thing just to note here, we've got to remember that the full responsibility for all students, including our students with Down syndrome, rests with the classroom teacher. The planning, the instruction, the assessment, the behaviour management is all the responsibility of the classroom teacher with the support of a teaching assistant. It's not always going to be possible to sit down and have a, a beautiful 30 minute discussion before every lesson. So it's about establishing some kind of system where that communication can be taking place. So I've seen this work lots of different ways in schools. Often it's um, an email, you know, at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, it might be a little communication book that the teacher and teaching assistant can quickly jot a note into. Um, it might be, uh, Google shared Google Drive or Google Docs, which allow you to add comments and, and information along the way. And this will look different in every in every class. 
it's really important that the teacher of that classroom provides information to the teaching assistant about the students that they'll be supporting. You know, what are their needs? What do they, um, you know, what are their strengths? What do they find difficult? What are some strategies that really work with that student? so that the teaching assistant has that information, but also information about the broader classroom that they're working with, not just the individual students with disability. So what are the routines? What are the expectations within this classroom? It's not uncommon for teaching assistants to be working across you know, five or six classrooms in a day. Every one of those will be different. So providing that information will really make sure that they can work really effectively, collaboratively and consistently with the classroom teacher. I think a really important part of this too is about providing information specific to that lesson. So what are students expected to know and do in this lesson? What is the big idea? What is the intended learning outcome? Um, what feedback would the class teacher like you know, from that lesson? Time is one of the biggest obstacles <laughs> I think in life, but particularly in inclusive education. And so I'm sharing on the right hand side here some really clever ways that the schools that I've worked with have been able to free up some of that time. So things like adjusting the teaching assistants work hours. So starting a little bit earlier in the day. So they've got 15 minutes before class starts to do some of this collaboration. Creative timetabling, like using assembly time. You know, we don't need every teacher and every teaching assistant sitting in the assembly hall. So using that time to free up some of our staff to do some planning. And when we're scheduling our staff, you know, non-contact time or planning time, trying to align those teaching teams together so they've got that time to talk about that. Moving on now to looking at deployment. So exactly how do we place our students within, uh, place our teaching assistants within our classrooms to support our students? And the most important thing that I can say here is that teaching assistants have got to be deployed in a way in which they supplement the teacher rather than replace the teacher. So we need to look at ways that we can be deploying our teaching assistants in ways that allow the classroom teacher to spend more time with students with disability. I'll give you an example. You know, quite often um, a lesson will begin with some whole class instruction. So all the students are there receiving that whole class instruction from the classroom teacher. They then move back to do some, some independent work. And what I generally see happen, the teaching assistant sits alongside the student with Down syndrome and the class teacher wanders through and supports the rest of the class. But what I'm suggesting here is that we have to flip those roles. We've got to switch up this narrative and it should be the classroom teacher who is the one that goes back and sits with the student with Down syndrome and gives them some extra explanation, some modelling, some scaffolding, provides some differentiation for that task. We have to avoid using the least qualified personnel to teach our students with the most complex learning profiles. So the teaching assistant absolutely can then be the one floating through the classroom getting the other students back to task, providing them with some assistance as needed. What we know is, is often an area where we see problems is when a teaching assistant is assigned and tied to an individual student, that they are funded just for that student. And some research that was done here in Australia told us that when that actually happens, we find that the teaching assistant spends 86% of their time within feet feet of that student with a disability. That's an atypically high level of adult proximity. So we need to move away from this idea of tying a, a teaching assistant to a student. And what I've done successfully with schools that I've worked with is shifted the mindset to assigning a teaching assistant to a class or to a teacher. In high school settings, we've looked at assigning a teaching assistant to a year level or a subject area. We need to avoid teaching assistants being fixed in one location or tied to an individual student. So that shift away from one-on-one -on -one support. Having a look at practice, how do we make sure that teaching assistants are really working as best possible on the ground in our classrooms? Big thing for me is to make sure that they're really appropriately introduced to the whole class. So we've got to move away from, you know, this is Mrs Jones and she's here to help Grace. Hey, this is Mrs Jones and she's here to help us all today. 
this is Mrs. Jones and she's here to, to help me today. And making sure that the, the teaching assistant is very visible in the classroom, is visible during whole class delivery, for example. This is not the time for our teaching assistants to be leaving the room to go and photocopy or prepare something. During whole class delivery, they are there at the forefront. If the class teacher is explaining a new topic or a new concept, the teaching assistant can be working behind on the board, drawing an illustration or modelling that with some concrete materials. Two reasons. One, it, it shows the students that this person is a very active member and it, it's someone that they can go to if they need help or if they've got questions. But secondly, it's an opportunity for the teaching assistant to see how the class teacher is teaching that lesson, to hear the language that they're using, the approaches that they're using to teach that concept. Some other ideas here when we're talking about the classroom itself, we want to really encourage flexible groupings. So groups that work with the teacher, with the teaching assistant, on their own, with their peers. So they're able to work in all of those different environments, not always just with a teaching assistant. Again, we come back to this big idea here that we need to use our teaching assistants as a resource to allow the classroom teacher to spend extra time with our students with Down syndrome. Something else that's really important here, we touched on this idea of teaching assistance often leading to dependency. We want to shift away from that and really make sure that everything that we are doing is encouraging independence. So things like making sure we use open-ended questions with our students. The second one here, help our students to take ownership of a task. And we do that by providing the least amount of help first. So when we give students a task, we don't sit down straight away next to them, assume they're going to need help and jump in there. No, we give them that task and we move away and we let them have a go. Let them try. I'm not suggesting you, you leave the building completely. We're still going to be there. So if we see that they're starting to have trouble, we can step in and start to provide that support. We want to avoid over prompting. It's human nature. I'm so guilty of this with my students and my own children. We think that we're helping, you know, we give an instruction, we can see they're not doing it straight away. So we give another instruction, we give another clue, another bit of information. And often all we're doing is just confusing and overloading what they're already trying to process in their head. So we have to allow wait time Okay, let them have a go with sufficient time. Camouflage, camouflage, camouflage. <laughs> One of my favourite words when I talk about this topic you're not disappearing completely, but we're stepping away. You know, we're pretending we're doing something else over in the corner while we're certainly keeping a side eye on what, what's happening. But we're stepping back. We're not hovering. And finally, we're really focusing on that process of learning, not the product. It's not as important that they do all 20 addition sums on their sheet as it is that they understand that concept of addition. If they do four questions, but they really understand what addition is and they can work through that independently, that is far more beneficial than insisting that they finish all, all 20 on the page. I've just put this um, slide here just to bring everything together that we've talked about so far. Some of my tips and strategies, things to encourage within our classrooms and things to avoid. So I've included that nice little visual reference there for you. The final thing that I want to talk about here is this idea of independence, one of the most important skills that we can develop for our students. And it's not something that we can ever teach. It is something that we have to provide the opportunity for our students to experience and to learn from. And I think this framework is a really great way of looking at the support that we provide and how to increase independence through that support. So this little framework here, we start at the top. And we always start with self scaffolding. So this should be our default position. Move away, let them have a go on their own. Now, of course, if we can see they're having difficulty, they might need a bit of help. We'll move to the next level of this framework and that's prompting. So we're just gonna give them a little prompt. It might be something like, what do you need to do now? For some students, it might just be a thumbs up, right? Yep, you can do it. Great job, I know you're doing really well some kind of prompt to help them along the way. 
If they're still having difficulty, we can move toward cluing. So this is where we might um, ask a question, a leading question, or give them a small piece of information to help them to move forward with that task. If they're still having difficulty, we can move now to modelling. And that's where we would step in and show them how to do that. So we would model it while the student really actively watches and listens and then tries themselves. And the final part of this pyramid is correcting. So that's when we would provide answers. And I know it's really easy just to, to jump right to the bottom, but we've got to become really mindful of letting our students have a go, giving them that time to, to be independent and to learn these skills themselves. I've included some additional readings here. This is a huge topic and this is just the tip of the iceberg, um, but some of my favourite things to read, some links to some of the research that we've talked about um, and some great little blog posts there. I would love to connect with you. I'd love to hear more. Um, my email address again, the website for Illum Learning. We have heaps of events happening all the time at Illum Learning online, virtual stuff that can be accessed from anywhere in the world. So please feel free to jump on. Um, you can also keep up to date with everything that's happening with us through our social media channels, Facebook and Instagram. But again, thank you so very much for being here. I am so thrilled to have had the opportunity and I really hope that you enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>